It was written 25 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. 25 years. Mark, people who know more about this than I do, Mark is not one of the disciples of Jesus. More than likely, they think, Mark was a person who hung around close to Jesus as part of the crowd and saw what was going on in the lives of many, many people as a result of Jesus being there before, during, and after the crucifixion and resurrection. And Mark wanted to kind of record it and share it. That's his gospel. This is the first gospel ever written. Mark, Luke, and John are a long time away. So, for 25 years, people came to faith in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, not because they sat around reading the Bible, because the only Bible that existed back then to read was the Old Testament. Remember, 25 years before Mark was written, and about the same time before Paul wrote his letters. What was going on as people were coming to faith? Because they got together and they shared something inside of themselves that was going on and meant a lot to them. As Mark was being written, the Apostle Paul was at the same time building faith communities. Remember, at that, during that 25 years, while Paul was doing his thing and Mark was doing his, Christian faith at that time was forbidden. Remember, they worshipped in caves under the street in Rome. Paul wrote some of his letters to his faith communities that he inspired. He wrote them from prison because he was in prison. It was illegal to be a Christian. Remember Paul's vocation before God touched him on the Damascus Road. His goal was to capture and kill Christians. Sounds unbelievable, doesn't it? Until, guess what? Paul became one himself. God does have a sense of humor. God touched his heart. So for 25 years at least, what happened to Paul was happening all over the place. God, through God's grace, was touching people's hearts deeply. Bear in mind, and this is cool, there were no prayer books during that 25 years. There were no Bible studies. There were no sermons. There were no microphones. There were no steeples. There were no adult forums. There were no confirmation classes. <coughs> Think about that. God was touching people without any of the stuff we're familiar with. Because it was happening right here. Would you hear my <laughs> Just word of mouth and open hearts for 25 years. God, through the Holy Spirit, touched people deep down inside of themselves. People encountered the risen Lord. Why? Because the risen Lord wanted to be encountered. We mention in the creed, don't we? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is God. We don't know who God is. Except what God chooses to reveal about himself or about God's self. Jesus is God living as one of us, amongst us. God chose to come live in our space, so he came as a human being to see what it was like to establish relationship or reestablish it. But then, you know what happens. He was crucified, was raised from the dead, and the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, is God taking on human flesh still. And I want to put something out there for you. The third person of the Trinity, third person of the Trinity, not the first, not the second, the third person of the Trinity is what I call the continuing incarnation of God's presence. God was present in the person of Jesus. That was the first encounter. Jesus died, was raised, returned to heaven. <clears throat> Holy Spirit is what? Well, what is it? God coming down into the heart of a human being just with the same flesh that God did with Jesus. Continuing incarnation. I want you to hold that thought. <clears throat> Continuing incarnation. 
God's presence in the human experience didn't end when Jesus died. So the early faith communities, Philippi, Ephesus, Corinth, Thessalonica, all these places came into faith, not because of anything that was written, but because their hearts were strangely warmed. God touched their hearts. God heard their longing for connect, which was raw and ready. And God said to them, I will be there for you. And God acted. The Holy Spirit of God moved them from doubt to certainty, from wondering and wandering, from waiting and hoping, into a personal encounter with the risen Lord that still goes on this morning. There's a story about ancient mystics that I love to tell people. And the story is, is that when God made the human puzzle, puzzle of the human being together, God kept one piece. And we spend a lifetime looking for it. Doesn't matter what your faith is. Doesn't matter if you're an agnostic, atheist. Doesn't matter. We all have the same hole, the same desire to connect with God. So what made the early faith community come alive and survive all this time is the awareness that the hole that has been empty inside of me has been filled. I have been found, and I want to join with others who have been found as well. That's what made these 25 years so enriched with the faith of God. We need to let others know about this. We need to join our hands, support one another. So they chose to gather together, put their empty hands out, and say, please, God, fill me, which is exactly what you do when you come to this altar, and you put your empty hands out, you are saying, God, this is the hole that I am wanting you to fill. And guess what happens? It's the same, same thing going on and on and on. Be known to us in the breaking of the bread. And God says, you got it. It's done. And God did it. Salvation, a little bit more. Well, salvation was happening, folks. Salvation right then and right now. There. And I don't know where you stand in this. <clears throat> Only you know this. But many people Believe that salvation has to be earned. Do good things. Say your prayers. Go to church. Pay your pledge. Keep God happy. And then when I die, I will be saved. <coughs> salvation is a Christian buzzword, my friends. It's all about the relationship that God has given to you. Does salvation end when you die? Does the relationship you have that God gave you, does it end when you die? Or when you've done things you ought not to have done and have not done those things you should have done? What do you think? No. Absolutely not. Grace is grace. If grace depended on what I do, it wouldn't be grace, it would be called guilt. <laughs> Many people use this word salvation as a power play. Another one is about heaven. Will I go to heaven when I die or not? Sorry to say this to you who might get hung up on this, but you already have heaven. You already have it. That's what the third person of the Trinity is all about. The continuing presence of God in your heart. That's heaven, folks. People say, when I die, I want to go to heaven and be with God. Guess what? You already have God because God is with you. <clears throat> what we have in front of us then is that you don't need to die to know you're saved. Through the Holy Spirit, God is already present with you right now, right here. That's the witness of the early faith community. <laughs> you are saved right now just because. And that's the gift of the continuing incarnation of God in and through the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God, folks, is already yours. Now. So stop freaking out whether God loves you or not 
But whether you'll be saved or not, or whether you're going to go to heaven or not, because the answer is very clear. You already have been saved. You already have heaven. It's called God's saving grace. It's called the third person of the Trinity. If you want to open the prayer book and read it, you're more than welcome to. God's saving grace is that the kingdom of God is already with you. That's what Mark is trying to say when he refers to the bushes in today's gospel reading. The kingdom of God is the reality of saving grace is like a seed that starts very, very small inside. Just because we say, Lord God, would you please help fill this hole that I sense? Begins really small, but grows and grows and grows and grows in ways we do not know how. It grows inside here, bit by bit. We live our lives. We have our moments of emptiness and doubt. We get lost at times in our tragedies. But deep down inside, in here, the living reality of saving grace grows and grows and grows like a plant planted in the soil. And then finally, the time comes when we have to do something. This is Mark's reference to the harvest and the sickle. As the early faith community learned, this awareness of God's presence within us must be shared. God has shown grace towards me and towards us, even when none of us deserve it. So now we and I need to act that way towards other people. There's something to be said about sharing the hunger of the heart and God's response to it. Live out in real time the grace that God has shown to you. There is an article in, or a letter in today's Herald Tribune that I think speaks extremely important to this, that we Christians have got to get ourselves in modes to start sharing the grace of God that God has shown towards us because, folks, our culture is quickly forgetting it. And it's going to be up to us, not anybody else, up to you and me. <laughs> to do that. Live out in real time the grace that God has given you. As we all know, the best way to learn something is to practice it. To learn what God's forgiving grace really means to you, to practice forgiving grace towards others. The seed will grow and grow until the time when it has to be shared. That's the image of the harvest and the sickle. The harvest is this, <clears throat> folks. I will do towards others what God has done towards me. I will forgive, I will reach out, I will speak, I will treat people as people. Let me drive it home, and then I'll shut up and go away. <laughs> In his letter to the Philippians, Paul says this, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The underlying assumption is, you already have it right now, so now go forth into the world and work it out. It works this way. Do you have grudges? Do you hold grudges against people? Do you have a judgmental tendency about yourself? What if God did that to you? Do you have an ongoing prayer life? If not, why not? I'm going to give you an example of a prayer in just a minute. It's good to say every day before you go bananas with your daily schedule. Take 15 minutes every morning. Go online. Find an ongoing daily prayer. There are a million out there. Or go to a bookstore. Get a lectionary book. Use it all the time. Because as you know, relationships deepen the more you live them out over time. It doesn't happen immediately. It's the same with God's presence in your heart, which is a gift to you. Grow in grace by living personally with every person you meet, just the way God has done towards you. See others as you have come to see how God sees you. Remember, they too have the same hunger for connect with God that you do. People differ in nationality, color, different faiths. But I will, will remind us, myself included, that the longing in the human heart is the same as the longing heart, and it is the same as the longing that is in your heart. There is no difference. The human experience is in reality the same for every.